Okay, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is the policy committee meeting of the Nashua Board of Education, Tuesday, June 4th, uh, 2019 at 6.01 p.m. Um, we have uh, Ms. Van Twyver. Present. We have Mr. Mosher. I'm here. Uh, Mr. Mosher is joining us by telephone. Are you by yourself tonight, sir? Yes, I am. Thank you. Mr. Garino is here, so we have a quorum. We also have um, Mr. Kaufman and Ms. Hohensey. And also with us tonight is Ms. Fitzpatrick. Here. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. All right, so we are gonna start with our first uh, item on our agenda, which is DDA grant refunds, material and services. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Hi, um, this policy just needed one sentence to update it. Any policies that refer to monies and grants, I run everything by Dan Donovan, just like with HR, everything goes by um, Dana O'Gara because those are the experts in those areas. And Dan added this sentence and said, now this is fine, it's in compliance, and it hasn't been looked at since 2013. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Are there any comments um, from the uh, committee members? Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mosher? Yeah, I've looked it over, and I uh, am in full agreement with it. And uh, if it's uh, proper, I would like to make a motion now. Can we have a discussion? Yes, no. Um, I'd like to second that motion. That motion. <laughs> that emotion. Okay, I make the motion to move. Move to approve policy DDA as I, presented. Instead of full board. Okay. Okay, and uh, seconded by Garino. Uh, Ms. Van Twyver, you said you didn't have any no, comments. No, okay. I'm full agreement. Mr. Kaufman, then Ms. Ho uh, Ms. Hohensey. Thanks, I have a couple of things on this policy. In the, I guess the first question is, what are the, what are the school district grant guideline, guidance policies? Are there are specific policies you're referring to? So for example, if a grant is over $5,000, the school board has to vote to accept it. So it's part of this policy? Well, it's- That's what's in this policy. I'm sorry, yeah. This policy, are you referring is your comment referring to the policy we're reviewing? Yes. So the policies for the grants are here, but Dan said we needed to add that one sentence saying that we were going to be following the code of federal regulations and school district grant guidance policies. And the policies are below, but most important, it's the federal regulations and making sure that we are following the policy. So we're saying, yes, we're gonna do this. I know it sounds a little redundant, but. No, I understand the distinction okay. for the federal. That makes complete sense to me, and I can appreciate what you're trying to accomplish. But I'm seeing it capitalized, which leads me to believe that it is of itself a published document. That's okay. where my confusion's coming from. That's why I asked you, okay. you're really referring to the things on this page. Yes, yeah, so. So it's not, it, it looks like it's a separate reference to a separate document. So you're suggesting lowercase, except on federal I'm, regulations would be uppercase, but school district right. grant guidance but policies. Even, I would say the, the grant, gui the, the, you know, whatever's referred to below. I okay. Would, you know, I would refer to this same document because it is in here is based upon what you said. Okay. And then I have something else just prior to that. A grant or grant proposal is a request presented to an agency for funding. And I would like to say educational materials or, or educational or curriculum related materials. Um, I, I want grants if we're gonna get them to be targeted toward education. Right. And I, I, and I so for example, for example, a service that we would get under a grant, under the Perkins grant, they do hire consultants to help with different programs. And they're providing a service because they're a consultant and we're using grant money to pay them. So as long as uh, educational or curriculum related, I don't have a problem. I'm just concerned. Okay. I, I, I want to, I, 
I don't know, I just have a sense that we should focus our grants on educational. Mm -hmm. Chromebooks, teachers do that stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would like to see the money go. And I, I do have a couple other comments on the balance of this document. So, um, Okay. Um, well, Ms. Hohensy had her hand up too. Right. And then Ms. So why don't we go to Ms. Hohensy and then Ms. Van Twyver? Yep. Thank you. I too agree that the, the sentence in red needs clarification. If we use the title that we have of this policy instead of yeah, what's no. in capital, or we put DDA, that would be very clear. Then you know that it would be federal regulations and this policy, you know, the name of it, DDA. Um, and then down um, the section where it says $5,000, this it's just not clear there. It says under or accepted by the superintendent may choose to seek board acceptance for any grant um, you would say any grant above or I don't know. It just where is it? It's just so, not clear there w what the procedure is for the various types. So if it's under five thousand dollars, the superintendent has the authority to approve it, and mm -hmm. he can, in his uh, board meeting superintendent's comments, let the board know as a matter of courtesy mm -hmm. that somebody accepted a grant for two thousand dollars for Chromebooks but he can approve it without board approval. But if it's over five, 5,000 or over, it's required that we get grant appro uh, board approval. Okay, but I then, think what it's saying here is that if he chooses to, he could ask for the board to approve it for some reason that he thinks that he needs it. But in either case, it'd be nice if he notified the board. I mean, money's money and he has, he may approve it, but it would be, not just a courtesy, it would be nice to put it in the policy that we would be informed where the money is coming from. We are just informed. We get a report on, on all grants. Mm -hmm. Under finance. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. Ms. Ms. Van Twyver. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, I didn't have any problem, but now I do have a problem with this comment. I think what this red line says, this policy covers non-federal grants, okay? Oh, so all time. other f federal grants will follow the code of, I think he's just trying to clarify that uh, other grants that come from the feds uh, follow the code of federal regulation and the school district grant guidance, just as an information type thing. I don't think it, it means that there's a separate, um, but that's my interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think what's going on here with this sentence is that it's basically saying the policy covers non-federal grants, yep. okay? And then it explains that all federal grants will follow a code of federal regulations, which is separate. Um, yeah, and the kind of school the district uh, grant guidance policies. Um, so you, you, you said that those policies are these below, is that correct? Right, and, and so, federal grants, for example, Title I, Title II, those grants have specific rules and regulations that we have to follow. Mm -hmm. And all this sentence is saying is that we're going to do that. Okay, so, so what we could do, actually, is just say um, all federal grants will follow the Code of Federal Regulations and the school district grant guidance below. You don't even need the word policies. Um, and you could put lowercase on SDGG, School District Grant Guidance, below. Because these are actually not policies in themselves. They are actually part of a policy. Mm -hmm. So they're not separate policies. Okay. I mean, that's what I would suggest to the, to the um, members of this committee. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. you. A couple of things. You may want to change the title to specifically refer to this policy about non-federal grant funds. And, and, you, and you confirm that the federal are dealt with elsewhere. So this policy gets clarification through its title. The other thing, applications requiring prior approval, I would say any grant proposal that would obligate the district to ongoing expenses. I wouldn't put a, a dollar value there. I would simply say any grant proposal that would obligate the district to ongoing expenses requires, with an S, prior approval of the Board of Ed, and upon award, these proposals will require acceptance. 
I wouldn't put the dollar value. I would say any grant should be approved by the, especially those that require additional expenses either during or after the term of the grant. I think it's already clear that that's what it says. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It says grant proposals of 100,000 or more or proposals that would obligate the district to ongoing expenses would require private approval. So it doesn't have to be 100,000. Any, any proposal that has uh, oh, yeah, ongoing right. expenses. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I would take the dollar value out. Well, I, I think the dollar value is in there for a reason. And what is it? Yes, then, Donovan. But I think right now you, uh, you people are trying to uh, overthink this. This is a simple, uh, simple document, and uh, you're trying to make <clears throat> trying to make a whole lot more out of it than what what is this. Actually, um, if I may continue, the my suggestion is that any grant proposal, any grant proposal, it doesn't have to have a minimum value or a maximum value, that obligates the district ongoing expenses requires board approval. And then, I'm just putting that out there, the next, sent, next section, awards requiring acceptance by the Board of Ed. And I would say all awarded grants require acceptance by the board, period, which would nullify the need for the $5,000 uh, paragraph about the superintendent accepting it. The board should know the grants coming in and we should approve them. Actually, I believe they should be approved at the submission the board knows that we're requesting money, and that's the time that the board should have uh, advice of this, so it can decide if it wants that grant, understanding if it has obligations for the future or not. But that's and, what the uh, applications requiring prior approval, it says in there that if there's ongoing expenses, that's when they ask for your approval. But we have people get $1,000 grants, $500 grants, $2,000 grants, if we have to get prior approval for every single small grant that comes in, it's it's going to tie people's hands. How many hands. are there? We should know what money is coming in. We're responsible for that one way or another. Right. And They're buying Chromebooks, let's say. They get mm -hmm. a grant for Chromebooks. The IT department all of a sudden is responsible for maintaining that equipment, and it gets into the rotation. If they get that, 80, that gift of 80 computers that we received, or it was a Chromebooks, from that generous family, that gets into I, our IT inventory. We're responsible for maintaining that equipment. That all of that has budget implications, either through mm -hmm. maintenance of people required, uh, certainly an electric bill to keep those things charged, as well as any ongoing maintenance to the equipment. And we should know that because everything that comes in, in here has um, an impact on money. And then as far as the, the last paragraph goes, usage of grant items. Uh, this addresses if a particular individual has the use of the grant. If a This essentially says if someone applies for and gets a grant, they have, I don't know if it's exclusive, but they certainly have first dibs on using it. And that makes complete sense to me. But I would like to add to this policy some language that says in the event that the grant recipient leaves the district, use of that resource, whatever it may be received by the grant, shall be determined by the building's principal. So in other words, Mr. Marcoux, for example, he'll tell you that he had a grant for some Chromebooks. So let's say he retired or left the district. He's, he's no longer an employee of the district as a teacher. So his equipment, in my opinion, should be reallocated by the building principal. That's what I'm suggesting language to do that in that. Oh, no, you're wrong. Well, that's your opinion, Mr. Mosier. Okay. No, it um, isn't. If you read the, down the, the bottom of the page, usage of grant items, it makes it perfectly clear what you're going to do with the, uh, with the stuff. Calm you down, Mr. Mosier. You are overthinking this thing, and you're making a real ass out of yourself. Calm down, Mr. Mosier. I don't think so, okay. Mr. Right, Mosier. Right. I'm pretty right. calm order, right order. now. All right, all right, all right. Ms. Ms. Van Twyver had her hand up. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we've got a couple of things here. Um, the thing about grant proposals of 100000 or more uh, or proposals that would obligate the district to ongoing expenses require prior approval of the Board of Education. Well, 
grant, per, what about those between 5,000 and 100,000? Uh, it says aw awarded grants of 5,000 or more required acceptance by the Board of Education. So there's a period between those two. I think I might be willing to say, yeah, strike 100,000, be because I'm not, not sure. Well, it says applications requiring prior approval. So uh, I, anything I, over 10,000, we have to approve no matter I, what. But, but I think grant. you're right. Yeah, wait, okay, go ahead. No I, matter I whether wanna... it's um, a grant or anything, anything over 10,000 right. we're supposed to approve. Right. And, and it, the way I read this, it's an or is uh, either a grant proposal of 100,000 or if you have any a size proposal that would require future funds from the district, you need to get that approved too. So that's the way I read that. But then awards granted of 5,000 or more required acceptance by the Board of Education. Well, that's about between 5,000. I mean, that's, it's just- I, I think you're confusing two different things. One is, right? a, one is a proposal, mm -hmm. okay, grant proposals of $100,000 or more. And then you're talking about acceptance, okay? Right. Acceptance right. of anything under five thousand, the superintendent can do. So we still have to accept any any grants. Okay, you're right. You pointed out the fact that this is grant proposals. Yeah, there's proposals and there's acceptance. So we can't even so submit a, pro a proposal that has a hundred thousand dollar amount or is going to cause ongoing expense. We can't even submit for it without prior approval. Okay, it's got when it. we get the five thousand or more that then we ask you to accept the money. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I, I agree with Mr. Mosher. I think that this um, this policy is good the way it is. Except I would I would like to clarify in that second paragraph in the sentence that we're talking about those things below. Um, so that we're not talking about separate policies. So I would, I would say to change the sentence to, this policy covers non-federal grants. All, grant, all federal grants will follow the code of re federal regulations and school district grant guidance below, so that we know that we're talking about that. So I, I would like to uh, the committee members to uh, give me your comments and uh, concerns about what I just said? I, I don't have any, well, I, I kind of think that there are some other policies that are part of this district that are administrative policies. I, I don't understand why they would point out the fact that um, th this policy is what we're talking about here. I mean, I, I just don't. Uh, you think there are other policies? I think there must. I think grants. there must oh. be a a district policy. Oh, okay, so in, right. So we could say that uh, all federal grants will follow the code of federal regulations and the school district grant guidance below, and any other policies of the district that apply. Does that make sense? Yeah, I suppose I. I mean, I, I had no problem with this as it is, but. We could just leave it as it is. We don't have to change it, Mr. Well, I think that's what we should do. Okay. Mr. Then. Donovan wrote this. Um, mm -hmm. He must know what policy he's talking about. Okay, what do you think, Mr. Mr. Mosher? I agree with uh, Rand Fiverr. Okay, so we do have a motion um, that says to approve policy DDA, doesn't want uh, which was seconded by myself. I can see her hand, thank you. Um, Ms. Holhensey, go ahead. We could shorten it to get the same intent if we said this policy covers federal and non-federal federal grants, then all federal grants also will follow the Code of Federal Regulations. But it doesn't cover all federal grants. Mm -hmm. uh, it only covers non-federal grants. That it's fine just the way it is. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, I think we've, Correct the time. I think that we have, um, I think that we've discussed this enough, so I'm going to take a vote on the uh, on Mr. Mosher's motion to approve policy DDA as presented. Um, yes. Ms. Ms. Mr. Mosher. Yes. Ms. Van Twyver. Yes. Mr. Greeno votes yes. Motion carries. 
Uh, three to zero. No change. That's with no changes, right? Right. As presented, correct. Okay. Okay. So, elementary level group grouping philosophy, our next item, Ms. Uh, Fitzpatrick. Um, this is something that we had um, brought forward um, and when it was brought forward, it was actually, Tara went back and checked the um, minutes and it was never approved, but honestly, it's just an update to change it, um, it uh, to uh, have it reapproved because 41601 was the last time that it was updated. And because it was sitting in the queue and there was no changes other than reapproving, we brought it back again because the minutes said it never actually got voted on. So what you're saying is that it's, it will be reviewed, um, that, that, we re that indication that we put on there that we reviewed this and there are no changes. Right. But it doesn't say that at that length. Okay. Right. But I do have a lot of questions. About the element, okay. About, about this uh, policy, which also leads into the other mm -hmm. one because uh, middle school has always been a big puzzle to me. I've never really completely understand how they operate. And so I have about four f different questions about this. Okay. Um, flexible grouping. Um, I didn't quite understand. It says a grouping strategy which allows a teacher to organize instruction and divide students into groups to meet learning and skill needs, student interests, and or for specific concepts of themes. Can you give me an example? I mean, yes. when would you group these kids together by student interest. Okay, so like in elementary school, if they do literature circles, students have a choice of which book they choose, so that's the literature circle they join. Also, for, for depending on the book that they choose, so kids in certain elementary grades, in certain elementary schools, do literature circles, so they get to choose the book that they want to read, and that's the literature circle that they're I included in. So that's an interest choice. Um, the skills and needs would be the reading groups when kids are in early elementary and learning the skills they need to become readers. Some kids may be struggling with certain concepts, for example, vowel sounds, okay? Mm -hmm. And other kids could be struggling with um, letter identification. Okay. It would be better to split those kids into group groups, small groups, and focus on the skills that they need to work on. It's not a permanent group, but it's to help focus on the areas that they need the most support in. And that small group situation happens that some kids may be working um, on, on their iPads or Chromebooks in one group, and they rotate through the groups, while the teacher is doing the more intense instruction with the kids that need the vowel identification and the para may be working with the group that are working on um, identifying letters. Those are examples of what I mean. Well, thank you, that helps quite a bit. Okay. And the temporary, is anything from a day to a week or to a month or? Correct. Could be as long as they need. Yes. Then um, they may also vary to meet individual interests. Flexible grouping may be implemented with a single classroom or among classrooms at a grade level or across grade levels. Mm -hmm. Do we do that? Um, to be honest, in the elementary schools, I know they do it across classrooms mm -hmm. um, in terms of grade level. I don't want to misrepresent, so I won't say yes or no, I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, this kid can't, uh, well, let's take your word choice or vocabulary is poor. Mm -hmm. So it's possible a third grade student could be working with a second grade student School. It's possible that, if the possible. teachers feel that that's going to work best for those students. Do you know how if that's practiced a lot? It seems to me like it's uh, time consuming to move these kids around like that. But I think more often um, the way the model usually works is that there is a reading interventionist and they pull together a group of kids to do that intense intervention, and that can be multiple grade levels doing the same intense intervention based on the individual needs. Mm quite flexible. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of the number of students, teachers are allowed and encouraged to use flexible grouping within classrooms. How many groups would a teacher have? 
it could vary, but I think practically wise that the most groups that a teacher would probably run would be three, four max because it would be really hard to manage more groups than that. I would think more than one group would be hard to manage. So well, how does that work? It, when when gr uh, group A is doing something, it's probably not with teacher interaction. Group B would be with t in group C. And how does that work? It varies, but I can tell you that in my previous district, our elementary schools had up to five groups in their classes. And the way it worked is that the preparation ahead of time mm -hmm. so that there is engaging activities at each station so that even if the teacher isn't there and the kids have learned the routine of the rotation from station to station and knowing what they're supposed to be accomplishing at that station, it can be done. Two things. Number one, the kids have to learn the routine. And number two, they have to really be involved in engaging activities at each of those stations to keep them focused. Those are the two main pieces to that. Okay, then my next question and last question, you'll be glad to know, is uh, alternatively other group strategies such as grade level acceleration, cluster grouping, curriculum compacting, and or direct instruction may be deemed more appropriate. What are those other things and who decides, is it just the teacher that decides which f format they use or? Because principals have something to say in this, I think. Yes, and I think that any time a teacher is going to be trying different strategies, what we're trying to do now is encourage people to try different strategies and assure them that if they're trying different strategies and they find that they're not working, that that's okay. They're not going to be evaluated on having a growth mindset and trying something with their students to see is this going to work for this group of kids and that's the thing it's about the kids in front of you every group of kids is a little bit different and if you have a group of kids that are accelerated then you're gonna when we say compact curriculum you may not need to cover every single thing because they already have that prior knowledge so that would be compacting the curriculum for those accelerated kids and on the other hand, kids that maybe don't have the prior knowledge, you would do different strategies with them to build up their prior knowledge. Okay, I, have, I fibbed, I have one more. Okay. <laughs> one more. Uh, the next one, principals shall exercise the authority to make decisions based on the needs of the student as measured through student assessments and or achievement indicators. What assessments would the principal use to make that determination? It would be a combination of things, but um, we're working on common assessments <clears throat> that we can use across the district. That's one of the things that we've really been intensely working on with Eureka and with the reading and writing programs. And um, in our sci all of our core class steering committee meetings, there's been a lot of K through 12 discussion and the different grade levels are working on common assessments. We have some summer PD planned for teachers that want to come in and work on common assessments. But also at this point in elementary, they also have the BAS, the, it's a reading assessment, <clears throat> iReady, SAS, and <coughs> excuse me, SAS also has a component in it that has interim assessments so that you can really target certain standards to see if the kids are hitting those standards. It also gives kids practice on the format for SAS. So when SAS comes, they're not being tested on test format, they're being tested on the information or whether or not they can understand the questions and how the information is presented to them. So. Uh I think I heard you say that there's a study going on now to develop a set of common assessments that people will use, uh, teachers will use? Yes. And when do you expect to have that uh, completed? We already have in middle school English, we already have um, two common assessments for the study sync uh, one and two, the, okay. In math, they've been working on the common assessments because they adopted Eureka a long time ago. Um, and, um, Social studies has been a little bit more of a challenge. They're working on it. And um, science, because we're moving into Amplify, that's going to be one of the pieces of using Amplify is developing those common assessments. So those assessments will be standardized over the, uh, we're talking about elementary here. No, yes. Right, no, across the 12, yes. 12 schools. Yes. Okay. That's, that's the goal. Oh, hopefully we'll get there. Yes. Thank you. I have no more questions about this. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Moshe, did you have any comments or questions on um, elementary uh, level? Elizabeth uh, Van Swiva, she had uh, mentioned a lot of the questions that I had in my mind, uh, but they've all been answered very, uh, very carefully, and I'm satisfied with it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hohensee has her hand up. Yes, thank you. I want to know what you mean by heterogeneously in the second paragraph. In elementary school, kids are grouped um, all together. They are not divided um, by, they're not homogeneously grouped. So students are not, when they're put into a classroom, there's all levels of students in that classroom. That is the standard for Nashua and all other school districts. That's not a new thing. So that being by age or by yeah, grade level? By grade level and by age. Okay, so yeah. it just, I didn't know what it actually meant. Then the other thing is we had a teacher come here and <clears throat> um, speak to us, I think about a fifth grade class, and she said that it was so difficult with kids that are learning to read that are on kindergarten level and some at eighth grade level. So she had a lot of different groups. Is there anything that we can do uh, this is very flexible, and it's, I mean, it gives them a lot of options. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, they're not jugglers. Is there anything we can do to minimize the juggling and help them accomplish what they need to accomplish? The kids that are struggling in reading do get math, uh, in, sorry, reading intervention. That's what the interventionists do, particularly in the Title I schools, because they do have more... Um, funds available to do the, those kinds of things. Um, in a perfect world, we'd have an interventionist that could push into every class, but, you know, budget. And so, as far as that one fifth grade teacher goes, <clears throat> I would encourage them to reach out to their colleagues and reach out to the principal for support about how to um, make that work in a way that is reasonable. Right. Like but it, each situation's different, so right, I, you know. Exactly, and, th and this gives them that total mm -hmm. flexibility, but I just hate to hear that a teacher is, is juggling that mm -hmm. many students, and if there was a way to, um, to have, separate them into different levels, at least for a, one subject, instead of rely only on interventionists, which seem more limited, if there, if there was a way that it might work more effectively. Right, and in some of the elementary schools, I am aware that especially in the upper grades, fourth and fifth, some of the teachers are starting to move the students a little bit so that, for example, one teacher may be the teacher that their expertise is in math, so the kids would go to that teacher for math, and when they're in there for math, the teachers whose teacher who ex expertise is English language arts would be having the kids in English language arts. So one of the things I think they're doing to sort of address those concerns is um, starting to do a little bit of shifting with um, classrooms full of kids for the teachers who have the most expertise in those areas to be the one in front of the kids. Okay. I just make I just want to make sure that we're giving as much help mm -hmm. to those teachers who are doing the juggling. That's mm -hmm. and, and I see this as very flexible. I just want to make sure that they're getting the help they need. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. One of the things I'd like to see happen, I've tried to bring it up in the past, and we, I've actually talked to teachers about it, was the transitioning from, say, elementary to the middle school, mm -hmm. and trying to put a process in place where um, the students that are transit, I don't know what to call them, because it's not a graduation, so I'm just- Transition. Okay, so that, that's mm -hmm. an okay word to yeah. use, okay that they be required to demonstrate academic proficiency in reading, writing, and math that demonstrates their readiness to perform the academic instruction at the next level, in, in this case, at a middle school. I think we should have some standards. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, I was talking with one of the teachers about was maybe not everybody, uh, maybe there's five and a half, fifth and a half grade, or five and a half grades, where some student is close to being ready to go into sixth grade, into the middle school, but they're not quite there yet. They may need some extra time okay. with some particular subject matter. I don't know if you speculate. Mm -hmm. But that the system that we have allows for that to happen. We don't want to hold anybody back, but at the same time, we want to make sure they're prepared, because if they don't have the prerequisites getting into the next level, they're already at a disadvantage, and we turn them into tier two and 
tier three students, and I don't want to see that. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see something. I don't know, even know if it belongs in this policy, but it came up as part of that discussion. You seem to be sympathetic to my concern. Is, is the district considering something like that? I, I know we don't have any kind of a test that you take from One fifth to sixth grade. No, no, I think, it, isn't this too young? Well, no, they take SAS in elementary school, but it's not required for the trans promotion. The trans no, promotion, it's not. The it's not it's too late, anyways. Yeah, that, um, you get the results too late. Yeah, you do. <laughs> they they come after the fact. But there's a couple of. It's kind of a loaded thought. I understand what you're saying, um, but we get into. There's two things. That's one of the reasons we're trying to work on the common assessments across the elementaries because that will be one measure to see how things are going with everybody. But it also gets into the difference between social promotion and retention, and that's a much larger conversation. Um, and along with that, um, parents need to agree with retention. So you're right, it's not part of this policy, but it is a bigger conversation. Can I you agree. put it on a future uh, agenda item? Yeah. Uh, that's I a don't curriculum. Know, it's a curriculum. Yeah, it's a curriculum. It's a curriculum, and we did talk about that a long time ago when we did the goal setting, and it it went over like a lead balloon. Well, maybe it needs to be revisited, though. I can talk to Dr. McKinney about putting it on a curriculum. I'd appreciate that because okay. I, I think it's worth having a discussion. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Mosher. Yeah, I uh, I'm listening to what how it's said and. Uh, I recall that uh, years ago, I don't know if he uh, might remember this also, but being that I'm uh, a bit older than he is, I could remember more, I guess, that uh, the school would uh, have classes that were broken up into, uh, let's say, the uh, 2A and 2B, then they could go to 3A and 3B, and uh, to 4A, 4B, et cetera. And uh, the uh, the B classroom, uh, let's say going from 2A to 2B, would be uh, where children were uh, not uh, going to be uh, retained, but uh, where they need something a little bit more intense in the way of uh, instruction to move on, along to the next, uh, the next um, classroom up, so that they would go from, say, the 2B to the 3A, and if they uh, needed uh, some help along that way, they could be moved into a, a 3B. And uh, this here, you had students which would be more or less all on the same level, but not at the level where they would be re uh, retained, but where the instruction would be a little bit more intense, so that they could move on to the next, uh, the next next grade up. So it seemed to work pretty good at that time. Uh, and uh, we had the, a teacher who handled the, the one class and the, the, a different uh, teacher who would attend to the other class. But they would still be in the same grade level, but one would be a little bit more advanced than the other one, simply for the fact that uh, there was no such thing as a retention unless there was some extraordinary reason uh, that a child would be uh, retained in a grade. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about that, and, uh, you know, it, I would uh, talk about it. It brought this all back into my mind because I, I had lived through this, uh, this kind of uh, system, and it seems to work pretty good. I, I, I went... Uh, one time, because I had uh, been very uh, ill during that one grade, that I wasn't retained, but I was put in a, uh, another group that where I could easily catch up to the uh, to the group and then move on to the, the next uh, the next class up. So I think that uh, you know it uh, might be a good idea to have some kind of separation like that. And not uh, necessarily think about retention, but at the same time think about the instruction level that in the, uh, in the seventh grade it would be a little bit more intense to uh, bring them all up to the same level. So 
I think that maybe this uh, needs a little more discussion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mosher. Um, so we, we have the, uh, our policy, uh, which is uh, before us right now. I can entertain a motion to approve it as presented. I move to approve policy ILAA as presented and move it forward to the full board for approval. Okay. Second. Okay. On the motion, uh, Mr. Mosher? Yes. Ms. Van Twyver? Yes. Mr. Greeno votes yes. Motion carries three to zero. Okay. Our, uh, on the back of this, we have elementary level grouping philosophy 2231, which I believe uh, we need to rescind. Mm -hmm. So I could. Um, um, entertain a motion to rescind policy 2231. I move to rescind policy 2231. Oh, second. Okay. Okay, on the policy, on the motion to rescind policy 2231, um, Mr. Mosher? Yes. Ms. Van Twyver? Yes. Mr. Garino votes yes. Motion carries three to zero. Okay. All right. So our last item on the agenda is policy ILAB, middle level education policy. Um, Ms. Fitzpatrick. So um, historically, this has been before the uh, policy subcommittee and uh, was sent back because the union representation felt that there was some concerns. Dr. Mosley and I met with the union leadership. Um, I altered the policy to try to acknowledge their concerns. I then went back and forth with Adam over email about the policy. Um, there was another meeting with Adam, myself, and two of the middle school union representatives. And this policy that's before you is a compromise. I'm gonna be completely honest. I was not gonna give union everything that they asked for in the policy because ultimately what it boiled down to was that they wanted to have complete control over, they wanted to keep ability grouping and we're trying to move towards flexible grouping because many, many teachers across the middle school are already doing flexible grouping. So the things that I put in here specifically to address their concerns are the two blue par uh, paragraphs near the bottom. Scheduling students for the purpose of team placement is solely the responsibility of the principal because they felt if the teachers were in charge of doing that, it was a change in working conditions. Some teachers do schedule their teams, but they don't have to. It's the principal's responsibility. After a student's team is determined, individual class assignments may occur in collaboration with the team of teachers and principals. Most teachers prefer to place students on, in the classroom rotation on the team, but they don't have to, they can do it with the principal. They can tell the principal that you do it. Um, the other thing that they were very concerned about was um, the preparation. So uh, teachers will not be expected to prepare more than four different class preparations. However, differentiation and scaffolding for student success do not apply. Further, an adherence with collective bargaining agreement, um, and you can see the numbers, flexible grouping of students will not exceed 31 students in core classes because that is directly out of the contract. The thing that's not out of the contract that they took exception with was um, that it, the class preparation does it include differentiation and scaffolding, which even teachers at the high school level, level differentiate and scaffold. That's something teachers do. Can you give me here, an example? One, yeah, here, here I found this uh, policy to be very confusing with terminology. Okay. Uh, I really did. Um, so I don't understand differentiation as opposed to grouping people together. 
and I don't know what in the heck scaffolding. For me, scaffolding, you stand on a thing, a, a right. pa plank to paint the house, you know? I don't understand that. Here's an example of scaffolding. In scaffolding, and this is uh, sort of a big example. In scaffolding, you would not give a seventh grade student a 10-page term paper and say, here's the assignment, it's due in a month. You scaffold it, you would say, on this date, we're gonna be looking at your outline. On this date, we're going to be looking at your first draft. On this date, we're going to be, you scaffold the assignment and break it down into pieces. So that's an example of scaffolding. Differentiation are things like, if you have kids that are struggling and you're concerned about, an ex example, math, maybe they process a little slowly, but they can do the math. You may have some students that can quickly whip through the problems. I'm not saying they're correct, but they're whipping through the problems, and other students that process more slowly. So if you were differentiating, you would say to the students that process a little more slowly, you need to make sure you do these, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, because those are the problems that address the algorithm that you're trying to teach. Whereas the accelerated kids could do that and then some if that was appropriate. Um, Mr. Mosher, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, I don't like the way this is, uh, has been written. And uh, in my opinion, I would like to uh, send it back to the curriculum to have them go over it and uh, do a little rewording and uh, a little restructuring. Uh, of the, uh, the uh, policy, but I can agree with the uh, the concepts that are presented. But uh, the uh, the way it's presented in the, in that document that we have before us, I'm not happy with that. So so was this was this before the curriculum committee? No, I don't think so. No, no. it's a policy. It's a policy. Okay. Yeah, but <clears throat> um, I understand what you're saying. I, that's yep. fine. Um, Go ahead, Ms. Van Twyver. Um, I, I was going to say that myself, that this needs to be run by curic curriculum. I mean, it's really their ballywag that they need to flesh out. So, um, but I have a question on the first bulleted item there with team teaching. How in the world, I don't understand how that works. <laughs> Did, okay, two so. Two teachers are in the same classroom? No. Or? That would be co-teaching and... Um, That's co-teaching. Yeah, co-teaching is two people in the class. And so, for example, we do have some middle school teachers in the district that are co-teaching. I also did co-teaching for 14 years. It's a regular education teacher in the classroom with a special education teacher, and you're teaching together. The special education teacher doesn't sit in the back like a para. The special education teacher does start some of the instruction. The regular education does some of the instruction you plan together. Um, it's, it can be wonderful if people are invested in that process. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about teams of teachers. So you would have the core subject teachers share all the same students so that you keep a closer when they're in elementary school, the main teacher, they usually have one main teacher, and in the classes I mentioned before where they're shifting between two teachers, they have their home base. In middle school, because they have so many different teachers, core teachers plus UAs, there has to be a group of teachers that know that student and are responsible for that student so that they can support the student in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be supported. And they're not like that in high school because high schools don't work in teams. So it's specific to middle school to make sure that the kids are getting the supports they need. And the kinds of things that can happen with teams is that I could go into one of the math teachers and say, I'm having a really hard time with Johnny and I can't quite understand what works for you. And so sometimes it's around discipline, sometimes it's around helping them understand concepts, sometimes it's around, do you know if something's going on with Johnny because he's acting very strange? And that teacher may have a closer connection to the student even though we work in a team and will have information that will help me and inform me in terms of working with Johnny. So the idea between about team teaching is that you have more eyes on individual students supporting them, and less kids fall through the cracks. Do you find that very successful? 
That's all I ever did was team teach yeah. and, and co-teach. That's what I, for 20 years. I have, I have seen team teaching at Elm Street Middle School because my kids went to Elm Street mm -hmm. and I, I thought it was very successful. They, they know how to challenge your, your kids where they need more challenging, um, you know, like with my kids, it was organization skills and um, the teachers would make a strategy because they know this student had poor organizational skills. Mm -hmm. And so they try to do things to help that student, which, yeah, so I, I thought it, it, it worked really, really, really great, you know, especially if parents, and it, it's good for communication with parents too. They, they were very good uh, at Elm Street to communicate with the parents. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just have a question about um, this uh, differentiation. How, however, differentiation and scaffolding for student success do not apply. It's do not apply to what? To the, prep, to the preparation. To the preparation, because, okay. Um, <clears throat> because based on the conversation with the union, okay. my understanding was that they felt that adding differentiation and scra scaffolding to class preparation actually increased the number of preparations, which I disagree with. Oh, okay. So, it's, so a, it's a philosophical difference. And, you know, and like I said, things that are in here, there's compromise in here. This was a, this is a compromise. This is not me saying, absolutely, I'm not taking any of your suggestions. Many of their suggestions are embedded in this, but I couldn't see philosophically agreeing with everything because I know much of what's in this document is already happening in all three middle schools to a great extent. Four different, uh, <coughs> four different class preparations. That means that a teacher has to make four, uh, what do you call those everyday programs? Lesson or? plans. Lesson plans every day? <coughs> However, if a teacher teaches four science sections, uh -huh. that's really one prep. And then if you need to do differentiation and scaffolding, yes, that's more to do. But if you're teaching science, and most of the core teachers teach one subject area that they're licensed in, then it's really one class prep. Some teachers do teach outside of their certification. That's a little different, but not the vast majority. Um, Ms. Kaufman, Ms. Hohensey, and we also have someone from the audience. Um, um, Could we have it, them it, come to the table? It's up to the committee members. You. Sure. Okay. Mr. Con Can I speak? All, all one, one our minute. meetings are public and everybody is willing, is able to speak. If you come and you want to speak, you okay. can speak. All right. I'm just asking, uh, asking what, the, what the committee, what the committee members want. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, uh, you called me and then you said yeah. Ms. Hohensey. Uh, and then all you right. Said all right. All right. Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Kaufman and then Ms. Hohensey and then we'll hear from Thank this, you. Uh, this so lady. my concerns with this proposal is that we're doing contract negotiations in a policy. This belongs in at the next collective. They, 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 the the union and the superintendent and the board can meet and amend the contract any time they wish to through the collective bargaining process. But it looks to me that this uh, paragraph in blue at the very end of the document really belongs in contract negotiations. But citing the excuse contract. Me, let me, excuse okay. me, let me finish. The fact that you said it represents a compromise is in itself indication to me that there was a back and forth, hence a negotiation. While it may not apply to money, it is discussing what preps are in or out. And I would suggest that if you're going to move this forward, you do it without this paragraph referring to prep periods and referencing the contract, uh, that belongs in a separate agreement with the union, either through somehow through the collective bargaining process. Well, well, I Maybe, think let me finish, please. I think it's a difference of opinion as to the contract, so if what I the contracts continue? mean. So it's not really negotiation. I think you're wrong. Yeah, Excuse okay. me, if it's, I can be permitted to finish. Let me speak, okay? I think... What, the, what they're doing here is interpreting what exists right now. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I didn't change anything. I right. said it. No contract. contracts have been changed. No negotiation has really taken place except for how, how they're a asking each other 
how the uh, existing contract applies. Mm -hmm. So there really is no negotiation. Um, May I continue now? Go ahead. So what I wanted to say is I disagree with that. Once you start clarifying contractual terms, they belong in the contract. They don't belong in the policy. And the second piece is I would strongly encourage the committee committee chair to uh, speak to our uh, attorney that we use for these negotiations to see if he thinks it belongs in here. I, certainly, I, I spent two years negotiating the contract, right. so I have a little bit of experience, and this would clear, I could see this easily coming up in negotiation. Well, I'm not going to do that because it's not negotiation. Um, so with that, I'm going to let I'm going to let this, uh, this oh, did you have something? Go ahead, Ms. Holmes. Let me just say one thing. Go ahead. Um, we don't yet generally reference uh, right. things like Contracts. this in a, in a policy. Right. So. right. But, we'll but run it, it by him. Right. But, but it's good to have in there because that way there we know that, that we're going by the contract and we're not negotiating anything. Actually, sir, we are. And that's the reason that the union had an issue with this. In fact, I have a letter from our attorney, Stephanie Keating Baird. I'm on the executive board of the union. I was at the meeting that Mrs. Fitzpatrick referred to, and we don't have a problem doing differentiation and scaffolding. In fact, our problem is that those terms are not defined, and there are several different ways of looking at differentiation and scaffolding, many different theories. In fact, I have a, um, an evaluation of differentiated instruction from Schmoker, who wrote Focus, which was one of our books years ago, and he says, quote, um, the inno innovation differentiated instruction went on to become one of the most widely adopted instructional orthodoxies of our time. It claims that students learn best, one group by ability as well as by their personal interests and learning style. It said, he goes on to say, in every case it seemed to complicate teachers' work, requiring them to procure and assemble multiple sets of materials. I saw frustrated teachers trying to provide materials that matched each student's or group's presumed ability level, interests, preferred modality, and learning style. The attempt often devolved into a frantically assembled collection of worksheets, coloring exercises, and special kinesthetic activities, and it dumbed down instructions. In English, creative students made things or drew pictures. Analytical students got to read and write. And he goes on and on. It's about keeping things simple. Uh, I'm However, sorry, I, I just wanted you to um, say, state your name for the record. I did, oh, Stephanie sorry. Keating Baird. Oh, okay. I am a teacher at Fairgrounds Middle School. I live at 63 Amherst Street in oh, Nashua. Okay. And um, I am on the executive board of the Nashua Teachers Union as a member at large. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I didn't That's hear okay. it. I didn't hear it. Um, but from what I, uh, I'm, this is a little bit confusing because. It is confusing. because. But Differenti it says here that differentiation and scaffolding for student success does not apply. Right. So that means that if the, anything extra that we have to plan for that is not applicable as one of those four units. I have a letter from the union's attorney saying that NTU has an absolute right to demand that the district bargain over any changes to working conditions as a result of such a change. There may be a change in the responsibility for scheduling of students, shifting the burden to the teachers from the principal. That would be considered a change which must be bargained for. That was changed in here. So, so do, you, do you do differentiation and scaffolding now? It's, um, we do, but it is not, we don't have flexible groups now. We have homogeneous grouping, right. which means that all of our classes are grouped by ability. Right. So if you, you, you asked how uh, elementary school teachers did it with five groups, imagine 110 students. Right. Okay, 31 kids in a classroom, no para, no extra help. Now, if that's what the district wants to do, that's what we will do. But we want those definitions in our, in our contract. 
what is differentiation in scaffolding? Because there's a multitude of definitions for that. Differ differentiation in scaffolding. In our tr contract, we have definite definitions for words that affect our contract. This clearly affects our prep language in Article 8, colon 4C. Without clear definitions, the unions believe this, this policy could violate our prep language. Furthermore, the proposed definition of flexible grouping seems to be requiring teachers to do multiple preps in each class. The union is fine negotiating this language, but it needs to be negotiated. So, so I'm wondering why Adam's not here. I don't know why Adam's not here. He hasn't been around for a couple so, meetings. So, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you're speaking for the union or uh, you're, you're, I am. You are speaking for I've them. spoken to Mr. Hoffman this afternoon. Okay. I was at the meeting with Ms. Fitzpatrick. It was Adam, Mr. Hoffman, and myself. And I, you know, I think we were misrepresented here. We, it is not that we, every time we disagree, we get told how we are, are not searching for our own personal growth as teachers. And I, I, I'm really upset with that. As a, as a teacher, now I've got my union hat back on again. This is from our attorney. I am speaking for the union. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Ms. Hohensee. Thank you. I appreciate these two teachers coming here. I too was a little bit confused because I saw a homogeneous grouping on the old policy and not on the new. And I think we ought to have a separate workshop for this policy. It's nice that the administration worked with the union, but it, it, it's, they're not satisfied based on the fact that they came here. If they were satisfied, they'd watch from home. So I don't want any uh, upper, you know, I want everybody happy. I want to understand this better as, as board members. And I think if we had a workshop, either with or without um, Attorney Clausen, I don't know what parties feel like that we should do, but I think we should look at it in more depth before we start changing something, because it's obvious that if it's homogeneous on one side and it's not on the other, and how does it dovetail with the elementary, and teachers come here and they complain about all the juggling that they have to do, we need to look at it in context with the contract, which I worked on for a couple years. We can't just throw things and change things without looking at that contract. And may I add that we have students, like in one of my classes, in, in my, on my team, I have students who are reading on a third grade level. I have a couple who are reading on a kindergarten grade level. And I have students who are reading on an 11th grade level. Just took the iReady test. That's a fact. Can you imagine those students in the same class together? How can you say that it's one prep for four classes? I have five different classes, five different English classes, and they're all doing something different. They're not even you know, reading the same things. We, right. we need this input. Right. This is good. I, I just wanted to mention that this, this policy actually does say we're appropriate ability grouping, so it's not, it, it's not doing away with ability grouping 100%. Yes, but who gets to decide that? That's the other caveat. It's... Down like the principles. principles. Can I get in there? Sure, Mr. Mosher. And then that lady uh, down the end had her hand up after Mr. Mosher. The other lady. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go, know, ahead, I, Ms. Go ahead, Mr. Mosher. You know, like I said before, I agree with the the concepts that are uh, that are in this uh, middle level education policy ILAB. However, the way this is uh, done, it uh, appears to me like it's been done uh, during somebody's coffee break. And uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like to make a motion to send this back to uh, curriculum and have it reworked and have the, uh, have the, uh, the, the parts, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the, yeah, I'm getting tongue-tied here. 
uh, to have the uh, the parts, uh, you know, with better discrimination, so that we can better understand what's going on here, and uh, and uh, to work on this. And uh, the way it is now, the way it's laid out now, uh, I could never a vote on this. And the only thing that we uh, we should do with this is send it back and have it reworked and have it come out into a, uh, a more coherent uh, document that we can uh, we can talk about and then make a make a plan on and uh, and then pass it. So uh, I'd, I'd like, like to move that uh, to move back to uh, curriculum. I'd like to make a mo Mr. Mosier, it didn't go to curriculum. It didn't doesn't go back to it. It has to go to curriculum. It well, never went through the curriculum committee. Right. So, so, went, well, so wait, we should send it to curriculum and let them uh, go over it because this thing is very poorly done. A and second, a lot of uh, a misunderstanding yeah. is in here and it's very hard to uh, hard to understand. And uh, we can get the union to uh, to chime in on it at the at the committee level and uh, get the, the thing uh, done so that it's a cohesive done document. Mr. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mosher. Uh, Mr. Um, Green, can we hear from this lady? And yeah, then and I I have a few more questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Sue Judici, and I um, just retired last June. Um, I taught 40 years in middle school, the last 31 at Fairgrounds Middle School. Um, as far as scaffolding and differentiation, there are so many examples and so many definitions of this. And I've always said, and I've said this to almost every principal that I worked under, good teaching is good teaching is good teaching. And good teachers differentiate and good teachers scaffold. You know, these are buzzwords that these researchers come up with, but basically it's good teaching and good teachers have been in every system since, you know, dawn of teaching began. So, I mean, you know, they try to get us with these buzzwords and things, but I think good teaching is good teaching is good teaching. So, um, I agree yeah. with Ms. Fitzpatrick. As far as teaming is concerned, I love teaming. Um, in seventh grade, in all three um, middle schools, there are five teachers, English, math, science, social studies, and literacy. We meet daily. Um, we talk about the kids. We talk about exactly what she said. You know, Stephanie's acting up in my class, but Stephanie's a perfect angel in your class. What is the reason? And we discuss that. Um, we, you know, you make it sound like there's no flexibility. At the end and sometimes in the middle of each trimester, the team gets together and they say, I think Stephanie needs to be moved up to an honors class. And someone may say, yeah, I agree with you. And I might say, I taught science. I might say, well, mm, math skills, and I do a lot of math work with data um, analysis and that sort of stuff. I think she probably needs to stay in extension, but usually we can work the schedule. So Stephanie has a split schedule. She's in honors in some classes. She's in extension level in others. And we do this at the end of each trimester as well. We say which kids need to be moved. So it's not like they are in a track and they stay in that track forever. We get the kids from sixth grade, and the sixth grade teachers have made suggestions as to what level they think they should start out with in the seventh grade. So, uh, you know, if people want to make homogeneous grouping that it's inflexible. It's what's, what I believe, it's what's best for the kids. And, I, and I'll give you, this is anecdotal, though. I will tell you, when we were first with all these computer programs, a lot of us were not all that savvy with computers. So they sent down um, a girl who was no longer with us, who was very high up in the tech department, and she came down and she was giving us workshops. So there would be 20 teachers in the workshop. Well, you guys really knew computers pretty well, and you guys were pretty good. 
I was a dummy, and I am trying to figure out what this girl is saying, and she's moving like this, and I haven't even got my computer on hardly, and it's like I was so frustrated I couldn't follow. And that's what's going to happen if you've got a third grade reader or a third grade math student in, in my science class. I can go extremely fast with my honors groups. And, and I know as a teacher, as a science teacher, as a biology major, I know which concepts these kids need to get the general idea of and where these kids can go a little bit further. So I, I, you know, I think it does need to go. There has to be a big discussion. And my question is, this system is always asking parents, have parents been asked about this change in policy? Would they like this change in policy? There might be some that do. There may be several that do not. So I mean, I think you also need to get that input as well. But I just want to clarify something. Um, and I was a union rep for years and years. Um, as far as prep is concerned, a class preparation means a period of instruction which requires selection and organization of teaching content. What I did with my foundation class was, this, was the same concept, totally different resources that I used. And I had to pick them out, I had to make them myself, totally different. Um, and organization of teaching content, materials and procedures, and our evaluation of the written and oral work of the students. They never had same quizzes, never had same tests. Um, thus, if a school provides a given grade level into college English and general English, this should be viewed as two distinct class preparations. And at the middle school, Ms. Fitzpatrick, it was decided if you have an extension level, you have an honors level, and you have a foundation level, those are considered three different preps. Um, so I think this has lots more discussion needs to, and lot more people involved that need to, um, before this can be policy changed. But isn't there a curriculum? Thank you, you know, we've been discussing this for a long time at, at middle school, because I remember conversations that we've had, and it seems like we haven't made much progress as far as a, a congealing of people's minds of what middle school education should be. So um, I thank you for sharing today, because I, I, like I say, I'm, I feel like I'm a little more um, knowledgeable about it, but I still think that the curriculum for the middle school is not understood by a lot, including the board. And I think that uh, I think that the curriculum committee needs to take this on, uh, this policy up uh, and somehow get to some kind of uh, agreement on, on what it should be, what the education should be. Um, it, it bothers me that. I've been on the board eight years, and we don't seem to have made much progress in middle school education. And these kids that graduate, they're going to go up to, uh, up to the high school, and you know, we want them to be successful, so. And I think we have made progress. I mean, we, you know, I think that with the teaming, and uh, I know that I send kids to the high school, and they come back to me and say, oh, thank you very much. Um, and, they, and that's just not me, it's to, to several teachers. So I think we do prepare them, but you've got to realize the growth, what we have to go through. I mean, I personally don't think they should be coming to sixth grade middle school unless they're at, at least a fourth grade reading and math level. And I don't know what they have to do in elementary school to get them there, and I know you can't have a, you know, 12 year old sitting in fourth grade, I understand that. Too. But I mean, since I, this is personal opinion, I don't think we have a lot of academic accountability. And until the kids know we're serious about academic accountability, then they're not going to put their best foot forward. Because when you can fail everything in sixth grade, everything in seventh grade, and everything in eighth grade, and move on to the next level, they know that. Okay. They know that. That's the second time we've heard that from a middle school teacher, so thank you. I have one question before you go back, is do you think we should hold the elementary school policy for that workshop where we discuss the middle school? Is, I mean, is that, 
were you ha are the teachers happy with that policy that we just talked about previously? I have no knowledge of elementary school at all. God love them. Um, and I know people say God love, you know, teaching middle school, but um, elementary school scares me. Um, I just really think that, um, I think we really need to decide, and we talked about, it was talked in this meeting, we really need to figure out how we can get these kids. In fact, Mr. Moja made the point for us. How can we get these kids so that, you know, when they're coming to middle school, there's, you know, it, it, it'd be easier to do heterogeneous grouping if, this, if they were more homogeneous in their knowledge. But when you have, and truly we have, second, and we're not talking necessarily special ed kids, we're talking regular ed kids that are at these levels. I mean, they do the I ready three times a year. Now, I don't believe that that's the end all and be all of everything, but it gives you kind of some talking points and a general idea of where the kids are. Thank you for saying that too. Yeah. I've been a big proponent of I ready. Can I weigh in on the elementary school policy? Sure. That, I worked in an elementary school back a long time ago and they did do flexible grouping within the classroom and they did switch classes uh, like for reading and social studies between, a, it was in the sixth grade um, and also the fourth grade. It's a lot more manageable when you have 15 or 20 kids in, in, in the class to put them in flexible groups and a paraeducator and reading intervention and all of, and a special ed teacher who might also come in. So you might have a, you know, you might divide your class into three different reading groups, but you have three different instructors in the room at the same time, or two. Or you have kids who are able to work independently. You know, so it's a, it's a whole different animal. We're talking about 15 or 20 kids versus 110. You know, in classes that have 31 kids in them. So, bit, big difference with one person. I, I would suggest that we don't uh, mess with the elementary. Let's get middle school. We've been talking about it for too long. Let's get middle school happy. Yeah, elementary but... isn't changing from what it's been since 2001. All it is is updating. Yeah, I know. That's okay. why I say don't. Right. let's not mess with that. Uh, I don't think we need to have a, a, a session on that. I think that we need to have a session on middle school. Um, I, I have a question here about uh, block scheduling. It says it's an administrative tool used to provide teachers with common planning time, which is doing your four different groups of people here, and the potential for elongating blocks of instructional time. So talk to me about in the blocks of instructional time and, and do people elongate it, or are they, who allowed, are they all allowed to do it, or how does that work? So as an example, um, the sixth grade team at one of the middle schools does an interdisciplinary project that involves all subjects. They take that block of time where they can work on that interdisciplinary project. Some kids may be working on the math part of it. Some kids may be working on the social studies part. Some kids may be working on the English part. The idea of the block of time is that the principal sets it up so UA before, block of time, lunch, so that they have a large block of time that has the flexibility for the teachers to work with their team to do a different, different kinds of activities. Um, a, groups of kids working on a project that hits on all subject areas or um, focusing on, um, I mean, basically it's for, for project-based learning and those kinds of things where they're putting all of the subject areas into it. The block of time allows the teachers the flexibility for the kids to be able to move. Does this happen every day or is it no. once a, oh, when, oh, okay. All right, I, I have to admit, um, Middle school is so bizarre compared to what it was when I was in, in school, in middle school. Well, it was school. junior high. It yeah. was junior high then, right. So it's really baffling and hard to understand unless we've, we're teaching every day ourselves, which you, know, you don't want us to um, do that. But uh, like I say, I think we really need to have a, a, a good discussion at this at curriculum meeting. Just, just talking about not 
block scheduling, but for instance, if I know I need some extra time in a particular class, mm -hmm. I can say to where I know the kids are moving next, I can say, I need an extra 15, 20 minutes. And that teacher might say, well, that's fine because I can extend my lesson. So it's that type of communication team members have with one another for the benefit of the kids. And now it doesn't happen every day, Elizabeth, but it does happen occasionally. Yeah. It's like you're one big happy family. Or dysfunctional, or a dysfunctional members. family. Yeah. <laughs> or dysfunctional, yeah. It sounds dysfunctional to me, but then what do I know about education today? Except for the fact of what you people keep me informed of. Um, I don't know from personal experience. So we do have a motion on the floor. We have a motion on the floor, which is to send ILAB to curriculum committee to improve and, and rework. Um, so I, I wish we could put a time element on that. The other thing, too, is that, you know, if this was implemented tonight, how could you get it imp if we voted this yes tonight and it went to the full board, how could you get this implemented by August or September? Um, that to me is a problem. And th I don't know if there's any kind of data that would prove that this thing is successful. That's the other thing that bothers me. Need to have some data um, on it. I don't really see a lot of difference in this and what we, what we do already, except trying to figure out how this differentiation and scaffolding affects, affects it. But uh, to me, it seems like we're just asking asking them to be more flexible, that we're still doing ability grouping, but we're just trying to be more flexible. That's the way I read it, but it's going to curriculum, so I guess we'll, we'll work on it further then. Mr. Kaufman. Thanks, I'd like to uh, ask the member of the executive board of the union a question. Do you believe this should be done in negotiations as it is a contractual well, I think interpretation. You talked about definition. In yeah, particular. I think that depends on, on how it's worded and whether or not, and that just depends on what the bottom line ends up being. Right now, it's so vague. And so it's really a matter of trust. You know, it, it's as if administration doesn't trust the teachers to do the right thing, like differentiate and scaffolding. So they want to say that. And the, the members at large say that, well, you know, this is a way. If I'm not, if my definition doesn't agree with their definition, it's a way to lose my job. So let's define them. And then everybody knows we're on the same page. Okay. If, so so, so that was clarification my, in the contract would go a long yeah. way. So that, yes. Thank you. That was my question was, about differentiation and scaffolding. So if, if we had this same policy, but we defined differentiation scaffolding, would, would well, that? Well, that depends on whether or not it changes, it changes the teacher's workload. Right, it, well, what, within, within, the, within the existing contract. Right, you know, you know it what depends I'm saying? on whether or not it changes right. the teacher's workload. Right, right, and so so if we define if if we come up with a a a uh, definition of differentiation and scaffolding that that you're happy with, and it and um, you know it doesn't really affect the contract. It's within the contract, and you think it's within the contract. I, would that would that make sense? Is that what we're looking for? That's what I'm trying to find. I don't. I I can't tell you that because. I don't know what that definition is going to be, okay, but but that's where the that's where the uh, point that's where the um, uh, dispute right. is over that's the right. definition of, of those words, right? And there. whether or not that will change the teachers' whether that, workload, whether that will change the workload in the contract. So we could we we might come up with a definition. We could possibly come up with a definition where we don't have to worry about the contract. It's within the contract. That's that's my point, Ms. Yeah. Fitzpatrick. I just want to clarify from our meeting the other day. There was also exception taken to the last sentence, which says principals shall exercise authority to make decisions on the needs of the students as measured through student assessments and achievement and/or indicators. Uh, the union representation took exception to that sentence as well. Oh, they right, did. because okay. and let me explain that also because once again it's that lack of trust. If I say a student is reading on a third grade level and shouldn't be in the same group with students who are reading on, the, on an 11th grade level, and my <coughs> principal says that's too bad, we're, we're heterogeneously grouping them, right. 
then I don't have a choice, right. even if I feel right. that that's wrong for all of the students involved. So, so, so it's were, a matter of trust. Right, so if I were to write in that, in that last sentence, if I were to say that principals uh, shall, shall exercise collaborate. the authority with collaboration with their team, with, with, their, uh, with, the, with the teacher teams, right, W would that be more acceptable? To consensus, something like that. Right, right. But but I just want to say this, that you, you do have to have a, a final authority. Absolutely, and, and a you do. But, but, I, but I, no, I, I agree teachers should, because who knows the students better than teachers. I, exactly I, I agree right. with you. So, so I think that if we, I think that we, we, can, we can reach, we have some um, areas here where we can reach some agreement with. I think. Mr. Grino, can I ask? Go ahead. Ms. I just want to suggest maybe that the union brings a proposal that they would like so we have a contrast and we can talk Actually, about it. Actually, we did do that. That'd be wonderful because we Absolutely. didn't get it in our packet. And I definitely would love to see that. Absolutely. Yeah, look, I, I don't agree in on curriculum. doing anything with the contract until we understand exactly how middle school ed curriculum is going to go. Uh, when I read this, it sounded to me like all, all that changed was the, t the wording. Uh, and, and I do not believe, I haven't seen the data for last year, but I don't believe that our grades, the SAS scores are going up, but they're going down. And, and that says to me that some big changes have, be, have got to be made. I mean, it, and um, so I think somehow, it's been, it's been, middle school's been tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll have to say that. It's tough. Uh, Mr. Mosher, I don't did think you it should a, stay the same. Do, do you have a, a, do you want the floor, Mr. Mosher? Uh, yeah, I just had to okay. uh, make a, some comments here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I agree with uh, Mrs. Van Twyver that, uh, <clears throat> you know, what, with some of the things that she said that uh, really, important as far as education is concerned. But uh, I think it's become very obvious how poorly done this uh, prospective uh, ILAB is and the necessity for getting it redone in a much more concise way. So I think that we should uh, move the question and send this thing uh, out to where it belongs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mosher. So on the motion to uh, send ILAB to Curriculum Committee, uh, Ms. Van Twyver? Yes. Mr. Mosher? Yes. Mr. Greeno votes yes. Motion carries three to zero. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yep. Um, so we are at the bottom of our agenda. Uh, we're not going to rescind 2230 because we didn't move on ILAB. So unless anyone has any comments or questions or any other business before the board, I can entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Okay. I second it. Okay. Uh, on the motion to adjourn, Mr. Mosher? Yes. Ms. Van Twyver? Yes. Mr. Greeno votes yes. Motion carries 3 to 0. We are adjourned at 7.30. PM. Thank you very much, Mr. Mosher. Thank you. Have a good night.